All right, so we're going to get going here in just a second. Chapter 2, lie 1, page 31, if that was confusing enough. Chapter 2, lie 1, page 31. Does everybody either have a book or are sitting close to somebody with a book? All right, and if anybody doesn't have a copy of their own that they would like to get their hands on again, again, just let us know afterward, and we'll get ourselves... Hey, come here. Come here. How you doing, bud? Here you go. You want to read with me? You think? <laughs> Not sure? <laughs> Mom is giving you a look now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, page 31. Again, if it, again, like I said, if if you don't have a copy of the book, um and you can and you want to sit by somebody that has one great. If you'd like your own copy and you don't have one, let me know or or let Carol know if the, I don't know if Carol's going to be here this morning, but if she's not, let me know and we'll get you a copy ordered. Um, page 31, and they lived happily ever after. I'm already hearing some laughter. All right. So underneath that is the lie, the purpose of marriage is to be happy. Okay. To the modern American ear, that might sound a little weird. But there's some interesting thoughts in here, I think, as we get going. A couple of quotes, one from Henry David Thoreau. Happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, it will come and sit softly on your shoulders. There is some pondering one can do with that, I think. There is some serious pondering one can do with that. Psalm 1, or excuse me, Psalm 10. In their eyes they say nothing can hurt us. We'll always be happy and free from trouble. The psalmist there is being ironic, just in case you're wondering. Um, this is what he says other people say, but that's not reality, is it? Always happy and free from trouble. That would be nice, but is that the world we live in? No, and, that, and that's the point. All right. So the author here is dating himself, admittedly. I'm gonna, we're not, again, we're not going to read these whole chapters. I'm going to kind of hit points and summarize as we go and then open up with some discussion as we go through things. But he starts off with an illustration that I think is good. The Turtles were a popular group in the mid to late 1960s. They had a number of hit songs during their career, but their biggest was Happy Together. Right? We know that song, right? Most of us. Do, do, do. Okay, it topped the American charts for three weeks in 1967, knocking the Beatles' Penny Lane out of number one. It has been used in numerous movies. He enlists those, and in different TV shows, it lists those, advertisements. It has been sung by artists from Donny Osmond to Britney Spears. It, it's, it gives all the statistics, and then he gives the opening lines. Imagine me and you, I do. I think about you day and night. It's only right to think about the girl you love and hold her tight so happy together. Okay? The first time I heard happy together, I was a pimple-faced 14-year-old living in East Texas with my mom and brothers while my dad served in Vietnam. I was in the throes of a serious case of puberty and would fall head over heels in love when I had a crush on a girl, which was pretty much all the time. Happy Together was one of my favorite songs when I was young and remains so to this day. Unfortunately, woven into the lyrics of Happy Together is a seductive lie that is in a lot of songs, movies, and romance novels we experience as we transition from childhood through adolescence into young adulthood. For the sake of our marriages, it's critical that we see how destructive this particular lie is to our marriages and that we disentangle ourselves from it. The lie. Being in love and feeling happy are the most important things in marriage. Being in love and feeling happy are the most important things in marriage. Is that American culture? 
By and large, is that how Americans as a culture look at it? Okay, and, and because of what you see in Hallmark cards and movies on TV and songs on the radio, right? That's what's taught. So what happens when happiness and the feeling of love isn't there? That's the problem that he's going to start unpacking here as we go. Um, I'm Tim Keller. We'll, we'll, we'll often observe when it comes to marriage, feelings of love and attraction within a marriage, they come and go and they come and go and they come and go and they come and go. <laughs> yes. In, in, in American culture, and this is really where we could start discussing things a little bit already, American culture takes the feeling of love and it, it, it runs over the decision to love, where we don't really talk about the decision so much, the commitment end of it. We talk about and we focus on the feeling because what is we are as Americans? We are generally fairly self-centered, or as, as, as somebody who will be in Bible class shortly loves the, the, the word, I, I, I think I'm, I don't think I made it up, but um, anthropocentric. We are very much man-centered, ourselves-centered. And that romantic notion of focusing on the feelings leads us there, right? Um, it, we're American romantic. Um, it, it, Keller will use the term, the phrase, apocalyptic romance. It sounds terrible, but what do you, um, when, he's, when you're really thinking about what that word means, apocalyptic romance in American culture is, you are my life, you are my breath, you are my everything. That's apocalyptic romance. They are the end all and be all of your existence. That's the Hallmark card. Well, and, and Soulmate does wrap that up, right? But the, the, the you are my breath, you are my everything, you are my all in all, you are... What are we actually... Think about it. Who do we normally reserve that language for? <laughs> God in heaven, right? And we're applying that in the romantic notions. We're applying that to our spouse, which has all kinds of implications. When they're your all in all, your everything, your life, your breath, what happens when they fail you? Because they will, right? When they disappoint you? Because they will. What happens? Ke Keller, Keller says every time, if you put your spouse up on the pedestal, and I'm getting a little off track here, but we'll get back to this in a second. Um, when, when you put your spouse up on a pedestal like that, your romantic other up on a pedestal like that, and they're your all in all and everything, every time they fall off, your God dies. It's not a healthy way to live. <laughs> not to mention, it's kind of unfair expectations for your spouse. Um, if, 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 their, if their source, if, you're, if your central source, your primary source of joy and happiness is your spouse, this gets us back to the lie. What happens when they're not bringing you joy and happiness? You're miserable. And that has some implications. All right. Let's keep looking here. Um, because he says, and I would agree, I'm married. I like the, I, I like, okay, so I think being in love and feeling happy are wonderful things. I agree. So everything I'm, uh, everything I'm saying, everything the author is saying, um, don't, don't misunderstand us in, into saying that we, we, we don't care about being happier, or you guys being happy or having joy. Yes, we, we want joy, we want happiness. But there are some qualifications here and some clarity we need. Nothing else in life can put the bug, bugs collecting in your teeth smile on your face. But, <laughs> but that's, why, that's a really interesting picture, isn't it? You're smiling so big and you're so happy and you're just so ah, that it doesn't matter if you're, you know, you know, bugs are, so, you're just smiling no matter what, right? Um, but you cannot afford to make being in love and feeling happy the main focus in your marriage. If you do, then you have astronomically increased the likelihood that you'll be unhappily married. Back to Thoreau for just a second. What does he just say here? What was Thoreau's quote? Happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, it will come and sit softly on your shoulders. There's some things to think about there. Um, 
if you make happiness the main focus. I'm going to give you one application, and this is going to turn into our first discussion point. If, me, if being happy and your spouse being happy, okay, what, what's an American-ism? I think I just heard it this morning already once. Happy wife, happy life. Okay? That's an Americanism. And it really fits well under this category of happiness, right? Being happy. So if being happy and having your spouse happy is the end all and be all of marriage, if that is the primary focus, what happens when something is going on that needs to be addressed? Yes. If the tension is between, if happiness is the primary end-all and be-all, and that's the thing when you boil everything down to brass tacks, that's the most important, and something needs to be addressed, and something needs to be addressed, what, and, and there's a tension there, what's going to win out? You avoid the potential thing that needs to be addressed because you want them to stay happy. Right? And so what happens in a marriage, if one of the things that happens in marriage, and I'm going to say it and then we're going to talk about it, one of the things that can happen in marriage is if everything is wrapped up in the other person being happy and you guys as a couple being happy and that's the end all and be all and there's nothing else, apocalyptic American romance, you're going to sacrifice happiness for truth. Or, excuse me, you're, you're, you're going to sacrifice truth for happiness. Let me say that correctly. You're going to sacrifice truth for happiness. Yes. And so what happens, okay, Kim's already starting to unpack it. I can see her brain turning. What happens if you start making happiness in a marriage? Just start coming up with practical examples. What starts happening in a marriage if happiness becomes more important than truth. What can, what can happen? What are, what are things that you can see happening or have seen happen? If happiness is more important than truth. Okay, so you start lying about things. And then so on a personal level, you can start forcing yourself to becoming more and more a, 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 of a hypocrite, in, hypocrite, inauthentic, because you're... you're you just want them to be happy, but you're not really telling them maybe what you think? Okay, maybe you avoid some things, right? Or avoid them in the moment. Okay. Instead of maybe figuring out ways. One, one of the hardest skills for couples to learn how to do well is to discuss serious things without becoming angry. Because you want the other person happy, and then, but truth is hard sometimes, right? Wally. Okay, so I'm going to take that Wally and run with it a little bit communication. If you start getting into the habit of making happiness more important than truth, what happens to communication? You have a lack of it. Meaningful, deep, real communication starts doing what? Going away. The, communications that, the communication that is left is either inauthentic if, 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 if really the primary goal for a long time becomes simply happiness, that can lead you down a road where communication within a marriage primarily becomes shallow and superficial or outright deceitful as you just try to maintain the facade of happiness. Oh, that takes us a little bit back to one of the things we could ponder with the Thoreau quote, right? 
So if chasing the ideal in your mind of happiness is the most important thing, real happiness probably starts going away, right? And then it becomes truly a facade, a veneer, right? Um, what, what, there's a joke out there right now, whether you can, you could say Facebook, you could say Instagram or other things, but, but, you know, the, the, the Facebook, somebody will say, well, that's just your Facebook family. Because what do we put on Facebook? The great, the great moments, right? The happy stuff. If that's all there is, you start building a bit of a facade, right? And real starts fading. And the nausea is going to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And then you, and 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 then eventually, and this happens in a lot of marriages. If if it goes too far down the road of happiness instead of truth, eventually the facade just simply breaks down. So. Um, Here's why. I'll go to the second paragraph. Being in love and feeling happy in marriage are tied to how your spouse treats you. That's part of the problem with the lie. Okay? And like it or not, even the most loving husband or wife will treat you badly on occasion. All of us will at times wound our spouses by mistreating them. Count on it. If you've been married or together with somebody for more than 30 seconds, you know this, right? Once you get past puppy dog eye phase stuff can start happening, right? Things are said or done that aren't always nice. Okay? So if you tie your happiness and how your, to how your spouse treats you, you will find yourself feeling unhappy each and every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Your emotional well-being will be all over the map. If you're tying your joy to your spouse, you're going to be emotionally a yo-yo depending on how your spouse is treating you on a given day. You can maybe perhaps see where he's already going with this from the Christian perspective. You tie your joy to something fallible, to something that's going to occasionally fail you even despite their best efforts. Emotionally, you're going to be all over the map, right? Stability is not found Emotional, real, durable emotional stability, and this is going to be my big thought for the day. Real emotional, durable emotional stability is not found in relationships with people. It's found in a relationship with Christ. Because Christ is the one who's not going to fail, who's not going to let you down, who's not going to say something mean or cruel or be a jerk on a given day just because they're cranky or grumpy. Christ isn't going to do that. If you're looking from the Christian perspective, if you're looking for real, durable, emotional stability, do not look for it in your human relationships. You're always going to be let down. And then emotionally, you're going to be all over the map. Rejoice in the love that relationships give you. Again, I want to go back to what he says here <laughs> at the beginning, right? Rejoice in the, rela in the good that the relationship brings you. But don't make it your foundation and ultimate. You do that. And I guess, like I said, it, you're going to be emotionally all over the place. Because your emotions on a given day are going to be tied to, well, how did my friend treat me? How did my wife treat me? How did, how did my kids treat me? And you're going to be all over the place. On a very positive note, 
I'm, I'm going to brag on my dad here a little bit. My dad is Mr. Even uh, outwardly, even when I know internally, he's probably churning a little bit. He's Mr. Emotional, steady, Eddie, reliable, rock solid. Him and my mom have had some stuff happen in the last few months that would test anybody emotionally. A lot, we've had some. We've had a couple of family things happen. We've um, his, his the the. The, one of his two churches has basically been flooded out, and they don't know if they're going to get back into it. Um, and I asked him a few couple weeks ago, as, as a son to a father, Dad, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing all right. And I looked at him, Dad, how are you doing? He's like, well, it's been stressful, but I'm okay. And I know why, because my dad, if my dad has a gift, my dad's gift is that he prioritizes Christ, and because he prioritizes Christ and his time with Christ, he's got something solid to lay on literally when the storms are coming and the floods are coming. And he can be, and that makes him able to be the anchor of stability for other people around him, especially my mom. <laughs> He can do that because of where he puts his stability. Where the source of his emotional stability is. It's not my mom. He loves my mom to death. Don't get me wrong. He would be an absolute, he would be an absolute wreck if something happened to mom. They've, bo they've, already, they've both decided already that neither one is allowed to die first. This has been the agreement for 20 years. But my mom, my dad doesn't rest his emotional stability on my mom. It's on Christ. And that allows him to then be st stable for my mom and others. All right, so that's my big thought. Any uh, thought or reaction on your part before we get going here a little bit more? Okay. So again, I, I know I'm running through this kind of quickly in spots, but um, but I'm, I'm kind of partly committing you to, to, to reading this book and, and absorbing that way, because we just don't have time to talk about everything. Um, number 35, or page 35, I'm going to just read a couple of things here, just as a, as a, just as a couple of points here. Um, bottom of the first paragraph going into the second. When you make happiness an idol in marriage, a God before God, Exodus 23, you give Satan all the room he needs to steal and kill and destroy. Don't bypass the high cost of believing this lie. When happiness is the focus of your marriage, not only will you become quite unhappy, but you will also take your unhappiness out on your spouse. Misery loves company, and it always will. Or to put it another way, Hurt people hurt. Hurt people hurt. Um, again, he quotes on the bottom there, please don't think I am knocking, being in love, and feeling happy. I believe God has wired our brains in such a way that we are meant to experience and enjoy these wonderful emotions toward our spouses. Also, please don't hear me say that you should never let go of wanting to be in love with your spouse or to feel blissfully happy in his or her arms. What I am saying is this. The euphoric experience of being in love and the incredible happiness that goes along with it cannot be the central focus of a healthy marriage. Because if it's the central focus of your marriage, it's going to be the central focus of your life. And if it's the central focus of your life, it's more important than Christ, and then you've got an idol. You've got the, the whole... It, it, that's where I have become really, really terrible as far as an American romantic goes. I, I almost never find a Hallmark card anymore I like because they're all apocalyptic. They're all, they're all end all be all language. And as a Christian, I'm like, all right, I love my wife. I would give my life for my wife. But to say she is the most important thing in the universe and the stars rise and fall on her presence? No, that's God. 
as awesome as my wife Becky is, that's not Becky. And it's not fair for me to put her on that pedestal anyway. Because then I'm setting her up for failure when she doesn't live up to those divine expectations. All right. A um, couple of other things. Um, bottom of third, okay, the truth about marriage will set you free. All right, so page 36. One, companionship. When God looked at Adam's situation in the garden, he said it is not good for the man to be alone. God was sensitive to the fact that Adam had no other human being to share his life with and that there was no suitable helper. It tells you something about how, how God hardwired us human beings. If in a perfect world, Adam by himself was incomplete. It tells you something about how God hardwired human beings. Two, children. God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and increase in number. God made them male and female so that in the context of a committed marital relationship, we could fill the earth with other human beings to rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and the ground. God wanted Adam and Eve to have children, for their children have children, and for their children's children. Okay, you get the point. And it's another form of companionship. It's another source of joy. It's a way of carrying out God's will. But within the context and the framework of who's still most important, it's God. Um, change. This is an interesting one. I think we could spend a ton of time on this. I'm just going to highlight the big points. Change. God uses marriage to help husbands and wives become more whole and complete. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, human beings haven't been right spiritually, psychologically, sexually, and physically. Marriage is one of the most important ways God tries to take you from being a real mess of a human being to being a real work of art. In a healthy marriage, God uses a husband and wife as iron sharpens iron to help each other become more mature and complete. Um, one of the things that happens in a marriage, in a good marriage, is that the husband and wife, over time, help each other grow up. Right? Grow up and grow stronger and grow more mature. Each one brings different gifts to the table. They help rough off, they help, help sand off the rough edges. Wh whatever illustration you want to use. Over time, in good, healthy marriages, husbands and wives help each other get more mature. Um, and in the case of husbands, I'll just speak on husbands for a minute. I'm not so old that I don't remember what life was like a little bit before Becky and I got married. Me at 38 is kind of a different person than me at 22. And that's okay. <laughs> Trust me, that is okay. Those of you guys out there who've had a little bit of life experience or been married for a little while and can remember what you were like back in high school and college, which is probably the better person, the guy who's been a husband and a father for a while, or the guy who back in high school and college was, if you were anything like me, maybe a, maybe a little bit of a hothead, maybe a little bit emotionally unstable, maybe a little bit less refined. I'll put it that way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you take two stubborn, prideful, independent people and smash them together and say, okay, figure it out, is it always going to be smooth sailing? That whole, well, we're actually, we're going to get to that next. The whole, and they lived happily, well, it, it's happily ever after, right? The movie ends, the couple kisses, and then we just assume that everything is bliss and joy for the next 40 years at the end of the movie, right? No. <laughs> Couples that grow deeper and more intimate. Honestly, honestly, I can say this honestly. And Becky and I, Becky and I are currently in year 14. Okay? 
So we're, so some of you are going to look at me and say, well, you guys are just getting warmed up, right? We're in year 14, but I can say this much honestly. Some of the struggles, some of the pain, some of the hard conversations Becky and I have had over the last decade plus, if we didn't, the love and the commitment is deeper now than it was when we stood there all teary-eyed up in front of the altar. Not this one. It's, 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 it's deeper. Um, and, and that's, but that only happens because I, I, I think the best illustration I can come up with is probably if you've known somebody or maybe you yourself know. If you've ever been in a metaphysical or real battle with someone, um, and I, I, I've known a couple soldiers that have described, okay, the guy that you served with, the guy you went overseas with, the guy that you were literally next to, shoulder to shoulder, day after day, in the mud, bullets flying, there is a fusion of relationship and a depth of relationship that happens in that fire that would never be there otherwise without the fire. In marriage, that fire, iron sharpening iron, can in the moment feel painful and crazy and scary, but in the end when you come out the other side, there can be also a real strength there, right? Somebody you know has your back. Somebody you know who has, who has you covered and is going to care for you and not abandon you in the moment, right? In the heat of battle. There, there is some real cool stuff that happens. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Putting truth into action. Again, I know I'm moving a little bit here, but I, I want to keep going so we can maybe at least start looking at the other one here, um, too, this morning. Um, putting truth into action. Do the fair thing. Okay, so page 40. I believe that marriage is supposed to make me happy, and if I'm not happy, there is something seriously wrong with my marriage. I have made happiness an idol because I have made it more important than loving God, loving my spouse, and maturing into a full-fledged adult. I acknowledge that I think this way and that it is a lie. Okay, so identify. Um, in, in a coaching group that I'm in, we, we have a, a, a kind of a, an acronym that we run with a lot. Identify, validate, and align. Okay, so identify what the issue is. Validate, okay, why do you feel this way? Talk about it. And now how do you align it with God's word? That's what we're doing right here. So, okay, so if, if, if I'm making... Um, if I'm making happiness the end-all and be-all, that can be a problem because I'm in, the, in danger of idolatry. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Um, assess. So what happens when, when you believe that lie? Believing the lie that marriage is supposed to make me happy has led me to be bitter and resentful. It has let me, led me to getting caught up in the self-medicating behav self behavior in order to feel happy in a moment, eating, drinking, spending, lusting, and so on. By the way, that's actually a really good observation that we didn't take time to actually look at it in the chapter. If your spouse is the end-all and be-all and there's a day where they're not making you happy, that's when you are in real danger of falling into other garbage. Because if, if Christ isn't the source of your happiness, the sinful human nature is going to, okay, so your spouse isn't making you happy today, so I got to go find something to make me happy because I need my happy fix. And if you're not going to Christ, you're going to self-medicate with other stuff. And everybody has their preferred self-medicator. And you probably know what it is. You probably know what your preferred self-medicator is when things aren't going right. Whether in the relationship with your spouse or, or something else. You probably know what your preferred self-medicator is. And the devil's going to use that to try to really get you to implode. Okay. 
It has also caused me to treat my spouse unkindly, even cruelly at times. By the way, that's a real sad irony. You put them up on the pedestal. You make them more important than God. And when they do the inevitable because they're just human like you, you get mad at them for being human. <laughs> and you take it out on them. I mean, you just think about how, sad, how sadly ironic that is. That's what we do in American romance if we're not careful. You put them up on the pedestal. You make them more important than God. They're your breath, they're, they're your breath, your life, your meaning, your all in all, your everything. And then when they fall off because they're just a regular human being like you, you get mad at them. You're the one who put them up there in the first place, and you're mad at them for being human. All right. In your own words, assess the marital cost of believing this lie. Okay, biblical truth. So what I want you to do, the one activity I want you to do here, we're going to take a couple of minutes. I want you to look through these four passages he gives you. Pick one. Pick one that speaks to you right now most strongly. Maybe you think of, maybe in reading these you think of another one. That's fine too. <laughs> if you think of another one not in this list, great. But I want you to go through, pick one. What is the biblical truth you're going to get tattooed on your brain and in your heart so that you remember not to put your spouse up in the position of God and make them an idol. And I'll just read these really quick while you're looking. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, Therefore, let us go on toward perfection, leaving behind the basic teachings about Christ. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Find one that you can start applying to yourself as a reminder and an encourager to make sure that you're being fair, one, one fair to your spouse and two fair to Christ. So I want you to take a minute to do that. And like I said, if you think of a different one, great. Okay, now while you're wrapping that up, what I want you to do, if, if, you, if, you, and, if you and your spouse want to really dig into this, then what you do on pages 42 and 43 are act on the truth, confess and forgive each other, and then come up with a plan to move forward. If you want to really dig into the meat of this and really dig into the process and, and, and really... Um, really work on some serious growth in this particular area, maybe, or in just areas in general. Act on the truth. Talk about it in a deep, meaningful way, even if it's a little hard. Ask for forgiveness and, 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 and grant it, too. Um, forgive each other, and then come up with some way to move forward in a healthy way. All right. We'll save the prayer until the end here. And unless there's a question, let's, take a, let's start taking a look at the second lie here. Um, chapter 3. It's, re it's, it's, it's related to the first lie. Um, it's, it's, it, it, you could call it maybe 1B to chapter 1's 1A. Um, but it's got a little different flavor to it in some ways, too. Chapter 3 is entitled, You Complete Me. Or... My spouse can completely meet all my needs. I will start with just this observation. Those of you who are familiar with Chapman and love languages, if you are, okay? If you're familiar with Chapman and love languages, you will know exactly why he is saying here, why, why, he, why, um, why Thurman here is saying what he's saying, right? Because unless you happen to marry your clone emotionally, you're not you're gonna you're gonna have to really work hard to even mostly fulfill 
your spouse, right? And even then, never perfectly. Because you're wired differently. Again, the, the love languages, for those of you who remember, right, are quality time, gifts, um, gift, 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 gift giving or receiving, um, physical touch, words of affirmation, and I always forget the fifth one. I'm spacing out. Acts of service, yes, acts of service. And the reason I forget acts of service is because Becky and I both rate fairly low, Leah, fairly low on that one, um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, at one, one, way, one way, there aren't acts of service with my wife, the one, for whatever reason, she just doesn't like cleaning bathrooms. I get it. I, I've cleaned enough bathrooms in my life and in hotels and in other places. That, that is one area where I can get some brownie points, but if I just happen to randomly take out the garbage, it's not like she's like dancing all over the place and thrilled to death. That one doesn't rate real highly for her. Um, same thing with gift giving for Becky and I. Both of us, if it were just her and I, we would probably cancel Christmas except for coming to church. Because neither one of us gets real jazzed about sitting and ripping, wrapping paper off of presents. <laughs> it's just not our thing. And so it, it, it's just not. And it's, but there are ways where we're also very, very different, where she's way high on one and I'm way, way high on another. And this is where you come up then with the problem of the lie. My spouse can completely meet all my needs because we go in American culture, we too often assume and think from, again, emotionally, relationally, we think from a self-centered, anthropocentric perspective and we assume that because I really like this, they should too. Because I really love doing this, they should too. Or if they really love me, they're just going to just get all excited to do the thing that I really love to do. Well, is that realistic? No, <laughs> not always. Sometimes they will, for love of you, really stretch themselves. Um, but if you have two people that, in, if, if one person has a love, it, statistically speaking, sometimes you can have two people who get together whose primary love language is the same. But statistically speaking, more people will have a relationship where one is way high in one while the other one is way down, and then the other one over here is way high in this one while the other one is way down. That's pretty common. And now you have to figure out a way to make it work, right? And those hardwired things aren't going to magically change all of a sudden because you're married. Those are pretty hardwired things. I mean, can those, can, those, can those love languages evolve some over time? Yeah, but by and large, they are pretty static. And so if one person's love language is primarily gift-giving and gift-receiving, and you could care less about gift-giving and gift-receiving, by and large, for the next 40 years, that's going to be something where you're going to have to be very mature, carefully, and carefully navigate it with one another, because it's probably not going to ever be that one of you all of a sudden, all, or, or, those are things that are fairly hardwired in. And that is one of the keys of Chapman, is that Christian love being not, not being self-centered but sacrificial is going to aim at giving even if it's not your thing. And that is a key thing. Now let's get back to the lie here, though, okay, and focus on this specifically for a few minutes. Um, a marriage, I'm going to read these quotes here at the beginning again. A marriage bound together by commitments to exploit the other one's for, exploit the other fulfilling one's own needs. And he says, I fear most marriages are built on such a basis. Um, another way he could put this is most marriages in the American context in some way or another are consciously or unconsciously consumer. I'm going to get married so that I can get stuff from my spouse. He puts it this way. He says, commitments to exploit the other one for filling one's own needs. It, it's kind of the same thought. Um, can legitimately be described as a tick-on-the-dog relationship. 
just as a hungry tip clamps down onto a nourishing host in anticipation of a meal, so each partner unites with the other in the expectation of finding what his or her personal nature demands. The rather frustrating dilemma, of course, is that in such a marriage there are two ticks and no dog. If both people are looking to get, you're not going to have a whole lot of giving. Or at least not giving for the sake of giving. It's going to be giving. You're, you're go if you, what he's describing here is a couple whose marriage is even in the best of terms, even if things outwardly on the surface seem like they're going pretty good. You have a marriage where a couple is, all right, I'm going to, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, you give me this, I'll give you this. It's a barter and trade in a consumer relationship. You're treating your spouse like your vendor. You're treating your spouse like your butcher, like your baker, your candlestick maker. You're going to them to get something, and you're paying them in return, but it's not really a gift, is it? It's a barter. It's a trade. It's a purchase. In some ways, to, to go back to this, my spouse can completely meet all my needs. If I were to put it another way, are you treating your spouse like Walmart? I'm just going to walk in, and they're going to give me whatever I want, whenever I want. Or Burger King. Have it your way, right? Are you treating your spouse like Burger King? Where you, all you have to do is walk in and say, this is what I want, and they have to, as a matter of obligation, just give it to you. My spouse can completely meet all my needs. In the movie, What About Bob? Bob Wiley is, the, is a comically troubled man who has extensive laundry list of psychological problems. Bob is referred to Dr. Leo Marvman, a pretentious psychiatrist whose star is on the rise with the recent publication of his best-selling book, Baby Steps. Bob is desperate for help with his problems, and he par parasitically attaches himself to Dr. Marvin as being the one person on the planet who can save him. By the way, we've already set up an, a, a God and idol relationship there, right? Again, if you look at somebody as being the only person who can save you from something, and the answer is not Christ, you may have to look at a, like a, an idol issue, right? At the end of their first counseling session, Dr. Marvin tells Bob he is going on a vacation with his family and will not be able to meet for a month. Bob can't handle the thought of not seeing a psychiatrist for that long and has the gall to show up where Dr. Marvin is vacationing with his family. Dr. Marvin is understandably miffed that Bob didn't respect the boundary he drew, reminds Bob that he is on a family vacation, encourages Bob to go back home and patiently wait for their next session. Bob, being the super needy and super manipulative person he is, refuses to go away. The two have a classic scene. I encourage you to watch it on YouTube. It's pretty funny, so you can look it up later in which Bob pleads with Dr. Marvin to let him stay. Look, I'm in really bad shape. Come on, please, please, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, gimme, gimme. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, gimme, gimme, blah, blah, blah. Just to shut him up, Dr. Marvin foolishly gives into Bob's manipulative cries for help, sealing his own professional and personal fate in the process. Dr. Marvin tells Bob he can stay, and Bob proceeds to turn his psychiatrist life into a nightmare. I mention this scene from What About Bob because it points to a lie that many of us believe about marriage. Bob believed that Dr. Marvin could completely meet all his relationship needs and would be his psychological savior. Like Bob with Dr. Marvin, many of us believe our spouses are capable of meeting all our needs and can psychologically save us. The truth is they can't and you shouldn't put that expectation on them. Um, the lie, my spouse can categorically, completely, and comprehensively meet all my needs. He, he's, he's expanding on that thought just a little bit from the title of the chapter. Um, each of us is born with a God-wired longing for attachment. Yes, this is true. But where he's going to go in this chapter is the same place that Pastor Pauschin in his book, Prepared to Answer, goes. 
And if you're curious about that book, we have a few copies here at church. I can get you one. If you're really interested in having your own copy, let us know. We'll get you one. It's great. Um, prepare to answer and be more prepared to answer are both two great, not only for, are, are, are two great books, not only for personal growth, but also just in terms of uh, defending the faith, sharing the faith. They're great books. But in one chapter of his book, Paustian makes an illustration that has always stuck with me that really comes up here. Um, Thurman writes here again, each of us is born with a God-wired longing for attachment. Paustian puts it this way in his book. He says, each of us is born with a cross-shaped hole in our hearts. They're going to the same spot. Um, it's just Paustian just lays it right there right away, right? Each of us is born with a cross-shaped hole in our hearts. Yes, we have a desire for, uh, for we have a desire, a hardwired need for attachment, but the primary relationship and attachment the, from the Christian perspective in the Christian context is Christ. Christ. Be full in Christ. That's, that's, the, that's the theme you see come up over and over again in the New Testament, right? Be full in Christ. And when you're full in Christ, then you're able to function well in the other relationships. All right. Um, the second paragraph, I'll just read a couple things. Being able to achieve a healthy attachment with another human being is dependent on several factors, but one of the primary things is the willingness to meet each other's relational needs. Um, again, going back to love languages, um, some counselors might give you a list of 60 relational needs, while others might give you a list of, of six. Um, he mentions a book here um, by um, David Ferguson and Teresa Ferguson where they talk about different things. Um, they're all useful, and a book like Chapman's is really, really useful in helping to figure out your spouse and what their wiring is so that you can be better at being their spouse. But ultimately that book isn't going to help you if you're still looking to your spouse to be your categorical, complete, and comprehensive need meter. You're, you're still not going to be happy. Um, page 48, um, first full paragraph, the biggest lie of all regarding psychological needs as marriage is this. My spouse is to fulfill, is, to, is, is supposed to fully meet each and every one of my needs and is falling down on the job if they don't do it. <laughs> um, there are two lies here that often show up in this kind of thinking. My spouse is supposed to meet all my needs, but I don't have to meet all of my spouse's needs, especially the ones I don't want to meet. If that thinking gets too deeply embedded, then it becomes a war very quickly, right? Number two, if my spouse doesn't meet my needs, I don't have to meet my spouse's needs. That's retribution and revenge. And that causes all kinds of problems in, in the marriage relationship. Um, and he talks about that some more. The truth about marriage. Let's get to this here. Um, at least start getting into it here. We're basically almost out of time, but let's start getting into this here. Um, three critical truths come into play when it comes to our relational needs in marriage. They can be difficult to apply, but with God's help, things can get better. So what I want you to do, it, what we're going to do is we're going to read these verses, and then next time we're going to start unpacking these a little bit more. Okay, so Matthew 5, 3. First, we must come to marriage poor in spirit. And what does that mean? Um, we need to come to marriage poor in spirit. And, and what that means is really ultimately is we're coming into marriage humbly with humility, realizing that we take your spouse out of it for a second, that we are coming to marriage with not a whole lot to bring to the table. We come with all kinds of our own baggage, our own failings, our own foibles, come into marriage humbly. And then the second one, um, that God is the one who will meet all our needs, for, uh, Philippians 4.19, will meet all our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Keep, keep the Savior the Savior. Keep your spouse your spouse. Don't make your spouse the Savior. Okay? Don't make your spouse the primary need filler. Make sure Christ remains your primary need filler. 
And then number three on 51, finally we are to acknowledge that Christ did not come to, be, come to serve, but to serve. And then how does that play out and live out in your marriage? If Christ came to serve us, what does that tell us about how we relate to each other? Are you the king on the throne or are you the servant in your marriage? Um, all right. So we'll, we'll pick up there and kind of unpack these a little bit more. I want, um, if you can, I would like you to be ready to start talking about at least uh, chapter 4, which is lie 3. This is a great one. This one is really good at knocking down self-righteousness. My spouse is a bigger mess of a human being than I am. Um, and, 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 we're, and a companion lie to that, by the way, is coming into a marriage thinking, I'm coming into the marriage to fix my spouse because they're a bigger mess than me. That's dangerous. So anyway, let's close with a, a short prayer here. We'll, we'll grab the prayer from the end of chapter 2 here. God, please help me to stop focusing on my happiness and start focusing on helping me and, start, and to start focusing on helping me and my spouse mature. Please help me see the short-sightedness of seeking primarily happiness in marriage and help me gain the far-sightedness and understanding that the path of true joy lies in helping each of us grow. God, I am sorry that I have turned happiness into an idol in my marriage, and I ask you to help me repent of having done so. Please help me become more like Christ, the only fully mature and completely whole person to set foot on earth, and help my spouse to do the same. In the precious name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, guys, thank you very much. And like I said, next time we'll finish up lie two and start working on lie three.